All right, welcome everybody to your first Tech Talk of the day. Um, I'm Andrew Toth, work for Red Hat, uh, and I've been working on, uh, well, working with a group that's working on uh, a interesting uh, security topic, a uh, security project called Keyline. Um, and this is pretty much an introduction uh, to anyone that hasn't uh, been made aware of it yet. Um, it has uh, large, uh, Yeah, it, it wants to be out there in the world, so this is to try to help it get out there. Ambitions is what I was looking for. Uh, all right, so first thing you might be asking yourself is, what is Keyline? Well, Keyline originally uh, was a project um, out of MIT Lincoln Laboratory, uh, and I am honored to have uh, one of those founding members of that project with me today to help discuss, Charlie Munson. Um, so he will be helping out with uh, some of the presentation here. Um, but you guys can ask him about the origins of this after, if you like. Uh, but it was originally target, targeted to help out with the Mass Open Cloud Initiative. Um, so they, they initially uh, developed the initial seed code for that. and to tie into our hosts here at EU. Uh, it moved over into the Red Hat Collaboratory with EU. Um, we had some EU interns uh, working with us that helped move this along uh, in the scope of the MOC project. Uh, and that was in 2015. So our original seed code was 2013, then we moved to Collaboratory in 2015. Uh, then late last year, uh, we started the discussions about how to make this a full open source community um, and get everybody involved in it. Uh, and then earlier this year, uh, we launched our official community planning page. Uh, I myself have only been involved uh, with Keyline for about the past six months um, and helping to evangelize you know, the benefits of uh, what Keyline can bring to the community. So, Again, what is Keyline? Keyline answers the cloud trust problem. Uh, it provides access to hardware roof trust. It, in other words, TPM chips that sit on your board. Uh, it acts as a remote, uh, or it helps enable remote trusted secure boot, as well as integrity verification and encrypted payload execution. So, as mentioned, to uh, Keyline uh, uses t uh, the Trusted Computing Group's TPM hardware. Um, we're targeting to the 2.0 release. The initial C work uh, developed on top of the 1.2 release, but the 1.2 release and the 2.0 release are not compatible. Uh, so moving forward, we will only be supporting the TPM 2.0 specification. Uh, we also use the Linux IMA uh, subsystem to collect, store, attest, appraise, all those fun words, um, pretty much to uh, secure your systems uh, cryptographically. And we employ the SHIM uh, uh, bootloader, uh, first aid bootloader, to bootstrap the security into the system from the hardware on up. And we use the trusted software stacks uh, to build the TPM tools to communicate with the TPM chips. Uh, so those are the, the base um, pieces of Keyline. Uh, again, TPM version 1.2 was released way back in 2011, um, and the 2.0 version is you know the more recent one released in 2014. There have been some uh, recent updates to that that we're tracking as well. Uh, to make sure that we are uh, constantly in sync with whatever the newest um, uh, TCG specification is. Uh, TPM chips, if you haven't heard about them, they're actually all around you from in your laptops uh, to servers. Even if they don't have them, most server motherboards now have headers so that you can go out, get a uh, third party chip, put it on there. Um, and run it. I've actually just had to do that to a couple of my servers that I thought had them installed on the motherboard already, but uh, 
did not. Um, relatively inexpensive chips uh, to, to include, uh, like 12 bucks a chip. So, you know, there's no real uh, barrier of entry uh, to be using these if you don't have them already installed. Uh, so TPM chip performs the basic cryptographic uh, operations from uh, key and random number generation to cryptographic signing uh, values. Each uh, TPM chip is, has a unique uh, encryption key that is burned into it at manufacture time. Uh, so that is that hardware root of trust root that is used throughout the entire system. Um, the only ones that know about that key are the TPM chip itself and the manufacturer that burned it in. And realistically, the manufacturer should be throwing that key away um, and just having the identity of it and the public key. So every TPM chip can be looked up to get its public key from the manufacturer. Uh, yep, uh, yep, and so the, the key to things like trusted root um, rely uh, within the TPM in the PCRs, the program control registers. So those are cryptographic hash registers where as the system boots, the, uh, the trusted boot will hash a value at each stage and extend that PCR value so that you have an entire chain of PCR values that can be decrypted to verify that nothing has changed within your boot sequence. That can be done remotely. It doesn't have to be done on the system itself. The measurements are done on the system itself and the verification can be done you know, on your host system, you know, your, your management system. Just a quick uh, summary of the other uses for, for TPM. Uh, it can be used for you know, disk encryption, key protection, machine identity. Uh, you know, the interesting one here is prevention of online gaming cheating. Uh, so that, that's, that's a fun one to think about. Uh, but the one that we're in the Keyline community most interested with is the platform integrity and uh, remote attestation capabilities. So, as you're thinking about systems, and especially in the cloud, uh, you're, you're thinking of two, two, separate, um, uh, two separate offerings. Usually you either have a cloud system where you're only worried about the VM or container up top, and that's your only view into the system, or you're, you're worried about you know, the entire uh, infrastructure of the service um, uh, stack. So at that point, you're, you're worried about the bootloader and the shim all the way up. Um, or at least that's what you think. You know, you think if you can trust those, you can trust the, the whole system. But in reality, with trust being from the bottom up, if someone can get into that firmware area and put in a rootkit, which has been reported, uh, you know, it's a rip from the headline, you know, they can compromise that entire view of trust into your system. So then you can't trust anything in your system uh, at any point. So how do we remedy that? We remedy that with Keyline. Uh, so the architecture for Keyline uh, is very simple. We have an agent that goes on the node that can report, can communicate with the TPM chip of the cloud node. Uh, and then we have your offsite management set system um, that you can run your verifier, your, uh, your um, registrar, your uh, CA, you know, and uh, you can use those those pieces to do your your validation verification of your your trust. Uh, so this type of simple setup, we can support you know single site multi user, uh, single site multi node, uh, you know multi site multi tenant uh, bare metal, and we we actually have developed. Um, an improved system for use on VMs, which we'll get to uh, by the end of the presentation. So, a little bit on the operational model. Um, again, how, how the TPM works, um, especially for the uh, trusted boot. Uh, as we go up the boot sequence, each boot piece gets hashed and gets extended into the TPM register. Um, and at the end, 
uh, you know, it gets sent off and verified by the management. Similarly, for real-time for real-time file system uh, security, uh, we can hash uh, into a RAMFS uh, and store all of that into a whitelist, and then continually check to make sure that nothing has changed within the running uh, running system. And if something does, we can report that back and act accordingly. So again, uh, the secure boot pretty much says from your management system, hey, Mr. Cloud Provider, can I trust your infrastructure? Cloud Provider doesn't have to just say, yeah, sure, you can trust me. They'll send back the, uh, uh, the TPM uh, boot log signed by the TPM. The cloud user can then uh, verify it through the use of the TPM public key and say, yeah, sure, great. OK, and go load your, your workload. If not, then you say, okay, give me another one, you know, the hashes don't match. Similarly, very similar, similar, similarly, easy for me to say, um, you know, with, with the file continuous attestation, just keep asking, hey, you know, has, give me, your, give me your, uh, uh, your hash for what's currently running. If the hashes don't match with what you have in the whitelist, you, know, you throw a flag and you can cut off communication. So that's kind of the, the high level view of what uh, Elon does. Um, and now I'll invite Charlie up to go through the more deeper operational views um, and get into some of the more detail oriented uh, pieces. So let's go into a little bit on how Keyline works in a little bit of a more detailed level. So essentially what we already have here today is we have like a tenant running, and it's essentially going to be you, and then you have a cloud node that the provider is going to give you. And what Keyline is going to offer is two new components that we're adding to the system, and that is a verifier and a registrar. So essentially, if you want to use the TPM today to do this, the naive way to do it would be for all the nodes in your system that want to communicate, they would all basically check each other's uh, like trustworthiness. So you'd actually exchange the TPM quotes with each other to make sure it's trustworthy before you initiate a contact between various nodes. That, that of course doesn't scale very well. If you have hundreds or thousands of nodes and they all need to be able to communicate, they all can't just uh, verify each other's integrity. So what the verifier is going to do is it's going to be that central point of verification of the integrity of all the nodes. So we can push that work off into that one centralized area to make sure it stays trustworthy. And then the registrar is going to be essentially just a giant uh, storage of the public keys of the TPM so that we know which TPMs in our system. We'll get into a little more detail on the registrar also. On but essentially, what we're offering here is a couple of steps that we have. So for instance, let's say we have a key that we want to give to our node and provision it with. So in general, what we're going to do is we're going to split this key up into two pieces. And we're doing that for a couple of reasons. The first is that we want to delegate the responsibility of verification to the cloud verifier. And that's so we don't, of course, have to be there for the entire time. We can push the key off the verifier and then just walk away. We don't need to stick around. The second reason we want to split the key is because we want to show intent to bring up a specific node. Uh, we want to show that this is the exact node that we want to bring up. That way, the verifier can't just go and start bringing up a bunch of machines without our permission. We have to actually explicitly give that half the key to the node. And this is cryptographically split, so you can't recombine and figure out what the other half of the key is just by looking at one half. And so as I said, we give one half of the key for delegation of the integrity checking, the other half to demonstrate intent to the node. The verifier then is going to go through and make sure the node stays in a good state, and it's going to check with the registrar to make sure the keys are trustworthy as well. And if everything is good, it'll give the other half of the key over, and then the node can recombine the two halves of the key to get that original key that we were trying to provision the machine with. So the two big points here, that's kind of like that special key lime sauce. The first is the way that we're actually doing the registration of the keys to make sure that the keys are trustworthy and that it's a real TPM we're talking to, not just some random RSA key, for instance. And then the second one is the actual process of provisioning and bootstrapping the system and bringing up the nodes with the uh, secret key so it can actually access uh, like secret resources, for instance. 
So let's go into a little bit more detail now on how this works in a lower level. So we have various keys in the system. This is just a quick overview of the keys we're going to be looking at in the next few slides. So the first one is going to be the endorsement key, and this is what Andrew mentioned before. This is the one that's burned into the TPM that you can't take out and you can't see what it is, the private portion of that key. And there's also the public portion, of course. There's also an AIK, the attestation key. And uh, the reason this has to exist, this is the one that actually is going to sign those quotes. And the endorsement key is used very sparingly in the TPM. It's actually restricted to very uh, specific kinds of operations because you don't want to be using it all the time, uh, particularly for like security reasons. If you just constantly sign anything people give you, there could be some type of flaw in the algorithm and you can try to figure out what the key is and then your TPM is useless if that gets leaked out somehow. So we want to create a second key that's going to do all the signing for us that we can just throw away and regenerate each time. The third is one that's specific to key alignments and ephemeral key that is going to be a challenge to verify that during the registration process. There's the bootstrapping key, is the key that we're actually trying to bootstrap in the system. And then there are two other keys we're using for keyline. U and V is the two halves of the bootstrapping key. And then NK is the key that the node will produce to protect the keys in transit. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper now. So again, this is the registration process. So this is just between the node and the registrar at this point. So the first thing the node does when it comes up is it needs to register itself with the registrar. And so here we have that EK private key that's stored in the TPM, and we have the AIK, that attestation identity key, that's also generated by the TPM. But there's no direct link between these two keys. This is just a, AIK is just a key that's generated on the TPM. There's no real way to prove that they're related in any way. And that's where this registration process comes in. So the first thing that's going to happen is the node is going to send over its identity, which is just a unique ID that is given just by uh, like the provisioning process. It can be anything at all as long as it's unique. And then of course it's going to send over the public portions of its AIK and EK. And then the registrar is going to set, send over an encrypted challenge. So it's going to encrypt a hash of the public AIK and that, uh, that challenge ephemeral key that it's going to randomly generate. And this is a, a AES-256 key that's just randomly generated by the registrar. And you can see this is encrypted with the public key of that TPM, the EK. So only that TPM is going to be able to decrypt this package in order to prove that it actually has that private portion of the EK. So there's a little hand waving here. We can go into more details on why exactly this is proving a link between AIK and EK. But essentially, the TPM will only decrypt that if it owns the AIK. So we can trust that. So essentially, it's going to decrypt that and it's going to HMAC its ID using that ephemeral challenge key that it got from decrypting the package. And that's going to prove that it knows what that ephemeral key is to the registrar. So now it knows it was able to decrypt it successfully. So at that point in time, the registrar knows that the AIK is tied with EK. So now we know that we can trust AIK to sign all of those quotes. And it is rooted in trust into that EK. So this essentially ties that, those two keys together to make sure they can be trusted. Because we can trust the EK, it's burned into the chip, but again, the AIK we can't necessarily trust without doing this. All right, so now that the, the node has been registered with the registrar and we can trust the attestation identity keys, we need to actually share that key, the secret key in. So again, we have a secret key, and now we're giving it a name, we're calling it the bootstrapping key. And again, the first thing we do is we split that key up into two halves cryptographically, we're calling them U and V. And the first part of this process is we'll send half of that key over to the verifier to delegate responsibility to check the integrity of the node. The verifier is then going to send over a nonce, just a random number basically, just to make sure we're getting a fresh quote. It's going to be included in the quote. And then the cloud node is going to send back a quote of its integrity state that's signed by the TPM, as well as an NK, which is an RSA key that it just generates just to protect the key as it gets sent over. Because you'll notice here that this is an unprotected communication channel. If we were able to securely communicate, then we would already have some type of secret. So we, of course, can't do that. And after this, the verifier is going to check by the registrar to make sure the AIK is trustworthy. Because again, we can't necessarily trust the AIK. It's not rooted in trust in the TPM itself. And if everything looks good, it will encrypt the V half of the key and then send it over um, to the cloud node, who can then, of course, decrypt it and get that half of the key. And so the second part of this process is going to be sending over the other half of the key directly to the node from the verifier. 
So it's going to do a similar process. It's going to send over a nonce to make sure it's getting a fresh quote. It's not some quote from last week where it used to be trustworthy. And then the cloud node is going to send back a quote from the TPM along with, again, another NK public key to protect the key in transit. The tenant's going to check with the registrar to make sure that the AIK is trustworthy. And if everything looked good, it will encrypt the UK with that NK key and send it over to the node. So now the nodes can decrypt the second half of the key and recombine the two halves to get the original secret key they're trying to provision the system with. All right, so at this point, uh, we've successfully gotten our key over directly into the nodes and we provision the machine. So we know that the system has started out in a good state and we've given it our secrets, but of course now we don't necessarily trust the system as it goes forward, it might become compromised. And if that happens, of course, we want to be able to deal with that issue because it has our secret now. So essentially the way this is going to work is the verifier is going to keep on checking over and over the integrity state of the cloud node as it runs. So it's just going to do quotes over and over the similar process we had for the, uh, the uh, bootstrapping process. And as long as everything looks good, and it's just going to give a thumbs up, everything's okay, and it's going to continue on as normal. And now let's say, for instance, that some malware starts running on the cloud node. This is not a trustworthy image that's going to uh, match our whitelist of uh, trusted images that are allowed to be run. So now when it performs this quoting process, there's going to be a hash that's in that list that's not trustworthy. So the verifier is going to recognize that, and it's going to report that integrity violation to the tenant, along with anybody else who's listening in the system. And at that point, it can take automated action. So for instance, it can force the node to shut down if you want to do that. If you're using IPsec communications, it can cut off, uh, it can re revoke that node certificate so it can't communicate with anybody else in the system, just to kind of do a, like a dynamic networking. All right, so now let's go into uh, the IPsec communication that is given, made possible by uh, the Keyline system. So the first thing we need to do is we need to generate some certificates, so we need to provision them securely into the node. This is going to be the private portion of the certificates also. So what the tenant is going to do is locally on its side, you'd be running some type of a certificate authority where you can create certificates that are going to be used for IPsec communication, for instance. And at this point, we're sending over that certificate using the bootstrapping key we sent to the node, because now only the node has that bootstrapping key that we provisioned earlier into the node, and so we can protect that certificate using that key. And as usual, the verifier is going to do the integrity measurements as it did before to make sure everything is good. And if anything goes wrong, it's going to be able to revoke that certificate and tell the tenant that it's no longer trustworthy, so that certificate can be uh, revoked very easily. So this is just one example of uh, a way that that bootstrapping key we gave to the node can be used to send over secrets to the cloud node to make sure it stays in a trustworthy state and make sure it doesn't get intercepted uh, by anybody who might be eavesdropping on this communication channel. And it can be used in many different areas, not just sending over certificates, it can be used to uh, give it like credentials to connect to databases, it can be given uh, like AES keys to be able to encrypt uh, hard drives, for instance, or IPsec is what we're going to be focusing on specifically next. That's the example we've been talking about a little bit as we went. So essentially, the way IPsec is going to work here, we assume we've already given over those IPsec certificates to both of the nodes. We have cloud node one and cloud node number two. All right, so these nodes are allowed to communicate securely over IPsec using those certificates because they trust each other. And as before, the cloud verifier is going to check the integrity of the nodes to make sure that they're staying in a good state. So it's going to check both of them over and over again. And now let's say, for instance, that some malware starts running in node number one over here. So now when the verifier goes to check the integrity save node number one, it fails the integrity check. At that point in time, the verifier can send out revocation notices to everybody in the system, including the tenants and the other nodes that are listening on. So now cloud node number two knows that that's no longer a valid IPsec certificate, and it can isolate itself and refuse to communicate with node number one. So it's been effectively isolated from the system, and it can't spread or do any damage to the rest of your system. All right, so that's pretty much the way Keyline works. Um, and now for the less mind-numbing portion of this, uh, we're going to run through a run through a, a demo of it um, and show you how easy it is to actually get Keyline up and running and, and use it. Okay, 
So for this demo, uh, I'm using remote nodes. Uh, nothing's running on my machine. Um, we have two nodes, uh, one called Saturn and one called Neptune. Uh, let's see, uh, Saturn is being used for the verifier, the register, registrar, and the tenant. And um, Saturn, or sorry, Neptune is being used as the node uh, under um, uh, being monitored. So if I can do this on a skewed frame here. Um, so there's a couple things that that uh, we'd like to you know point out ahead of time. Um, one is that we have a one general key lump, uh, conf file uh, that pretty much has all of the all of the settings that uh, you can use and set. Um, and it has everything from, you know, which which hash you're using, uh, whether it's SHA-1, SHA-256, uh, whatnot, um, to, you know, PCR bank values uh, that you'd want to be attesting against, um, and, you know, any other system setting within the, uh, uh, within, within the system. Um, one, of, one of those, uh, settings is actually the ID of the um, node uh, that you're going to assign uh, the agent to, um, but it's a little hard to get to uh, at this view. But um, the other thing that we uh, want to show as well is you know, the communication with the actual TPM. So using the TPM tool, two tools, tool set, uh, we can communicate with TPM to be doing all of this. What I've just done is I've listed the actual registers within the TPM that get extended into during boot. Um, so as part of the first demo portion, uh, I'm going to show you how it uses these values to um, cut off a system from actually entering uh, your, your environment. Um, if a PCR value is wrong. So, uh, PCR, where's my mouse? PCR 9 here. That's too good to say. Um, 6D five nine. that's the uh, entire value we'll use, uh, but just easy. Uh, 6D59 will be uh, how we can identify it. <coughs> so first off, we want to start up the verifier. Now, the verifier needs to come up first to make sure that it can generate any needed keys uh, for the entire system to use. And looks like we're up. Next, we will go and we will start up the registrar. And again, the registrar is used to, you know, bring the uh, uh, nodes up into the system. And lastly, when a new node comes up, we need to make sure that the agent is running on it. So start up the agent. Okay. Now at this point, the registrar doesn't know about the the uh, the agent. They don't know about the node because we haven't told them. We haven't. Uh, made that explicit ask for that node to be included. Um, so we will do that now. And a couple couple things to note on this command. So it's the, the tenant command, which is included within the keyline system. You don't need to use the tenant commands. This is a REST-based system. So you can actually create your own management system, calling those REST calls to do the exact same thing. Uh, we actually do have a web front end um, that's associated with the project that can be used as well. Uh, but for this demo, we're just sticking to the command line. So uh, we have the tenant, we have the node that we're uh, trying to um, include. We've got the excludes file, which will come in in the next part of the demo where we uh, want to have that con uh, continuous attestation. So 
so I'll get into that then. Um, we have the ID of the agent that we're trying to uh, bring into the system. Again, this is this is human generated. This is not something that you know is known at the TPM or anything else. This is something that can be uh, you know done by hand or generated by another cloud system and used for each of the ind individual nodes. It's pretty much your node ID, um, what it comes down to. Uh, then we're telling it to add the uh, the node to the system, and here we're sending in the TPM policy. So we're telling it that hey, we want. Uh, PCR9 to have this value, and if it's not correct, you know, report back to us. So we're going, okay, it says, okay, great, I've added. So if we go over to the verifier, yeah, everything's going well, nothing's broken. Yeah, nothing's broken there either at the registrar. Now the agent, we can see, is now in its continuous loop to check its current state. So what this says is that that PCR value uh, came through fine, it was a tested fine, and this is, the node was allowed into the system. So the next step would be to delete that node from the system. Check and see, no more scrolling of the agent, so the uh, that poll cycle is now closed. And now, if we change, uh, one more. <laughs> if we change what that PCR value policy that we're sending in is, is um, and start it up. Yeah, you said bad. Yeah, <laughs> gonna add it. <laughs> Live demo's gonna pop. Okay, so here we've tried to add that node back in, um, and we sent it in the PCR we're expecting. Let's go over to the agent. No, it's not scrolling. It's not in that. It's not in that attestation loop. If we go over to the verifier, we can see why. Because it was looking for, you know, the 9 value, but we gave it an 8 value um, in PCR 9. So it said, nope, this is bad, not going to continue with this. So it cut it off. So that's pretty much the, the secure boot side of things. Very, very simple um, when you're seeing it. You know, the, the details were... Uh, we're, we're quite in depth on how to get there, but the usage is, is easy once you once you have everything installed. Um, so we'll go again and delete this. All right. So now we're back to a uh, known state. Back in the attestation loop. Okay, so what we're going to get to now next is that continuous attestation loop. So, uh, in some of the slides you saw, there was a whitelist being sent in and here, um, on these commands, you see an excludes uh, text file being sent in. 
uh, and those will be very important for this next part. Self disease. So, um, what we can see from this one is slightly different than the PCR TPM policy being passed in. Uh, we're strictly saying, okay, go uh, use the defaults for all of those PCR values um, on startup. Uh, but we are telling it that we have this white list, uh, which is a golden image list or, or a golden hash list of everything from a system uh, that we measured saying this is a known good state, uh, which is best done on an air gap system where no external forces can be changing you know, things underneath you. Uh, we take that list and we move it from the, from the agent node um, to the uh, uh, tenant node so we know what that is, so that when we start that agent node, we can send that down um, to whatever nodes we think should have that image uh, so that we can test against it. So there is actually a script within our uh, repo that will help you generate a whitelist, uh, but you can generate it yourself as well um, with any tool that you feel uh, satisfies the requirement. Okay. So, yeah, there we go. Okay. So here we're seeing that we're now into the attestation loop. We're checking the measurements list. And what we're gonna do uh, is we're going to create a Trojan file and, and show that it's uh, uh, show that it running running something that's not already on the system uh, will actually cause that integrity check to fail. Okay, so pretty much not doing anything exciting, uh, just replicating something that uh, may run um, and be bad. Uh, okay, so we 
can now see the Trojan SH on here. So this is the agent node. Again, this is this is on Saturn. Uh, so if we come over to the verifier, it's still checking. It doesn't report anything yet because a, a file merely being on the system, that's that's no danger really. Um, it's the execution of that file that that causes the the uh, a threat. So if we now come over back to the file. Make it executable, and then run it. So it's going on and it's running. If we go over to the verifier, you say, "Uh oh, something went wrong." It caught it. So it stopped communicating. It stopped verifying. It reported that something's wrong. So at this point, on the continuous attestation, you can hook in. Um, other mechanisms uh, to, to do replication. So you can have something that reports it back to the CA, so the CA can cut off the certificate and kill any TLS, you know, IPsec connection that it has uh, to segment your, your node from the system. Um, or you know, send out an email or, or whatever else you want it to do. Um, there's ways to build that in, those, those actions in, um, and get the report out. Um, so pretty much, like I said, it's it's, not, not too exciting, it's very easy, uh, but it's very useful. Uh, and that's pretty much the demo of both pieces. So, bring that one back. You too can run through this. It's all there on our man pages. Uh, you know, it, 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 as soon as you get it installed, it's, it's ready to run. Um, so again, very simple. Uh, once you get it installed, everything on the running side is documented. Uh, we are augmenting um, a lot of things, though. It's, it's again very new community. We're trying to get all of the information out there, trying to get it in a consumable that fashion and. You know, and, and get it right so it actually works. Uh, so that's one of the things that's currently going on in the community. Um, some of the other things uh, that are more technical bits, uh, we're, we're actually working towards our 5.0 release. Um, and one of the major changes is, is targeting, you know, the Fedora 30 uh, plus releases um, and that Pi 2 to Pi 3 change, uh, which has caused major disruptions through our uh, through our code base because it's mostly Python, uh, Python code base. Um, so that's going on and we're trying to port, uh, or we're in the process of porting uh, to a more secure uh, uh, cryptographic library uh, that actually passes FIPS compliance. Uh, so that's that's in the works right now for the 5 release as well. Uh, we're also working on packaging for Fedora uh, and augmenting um, the documentation like I was saying. And we're also doing uh, continual uh, virtual TPM uh, uh, development. Um, and what the virtual TPM does is it allows uh, your cloud nodes to actually work as cloud nodes on VMs. So uh, the major major impact uh, if you're running VMs is you don't want you know thousands of VMs on a system hitting a single point uh, of hardware. Uh, that's just a complete latency bottleneck. Uh, so we've uh, we've developed an initial uh, virtual TPM based on the Zen hypervisor, um, but the current work is to get that into the KVM hypervisor now. Uh, so that's the, the current uh, virtual work. But here again, I will have uh, Charlie come up and explain a little bit more about that if, if you feel like it. <laughs> As Andrew mentioned, uh, today we support the Zen hypervisor. At the time that this was written, uh, Zen was the only one that supported virtual TPM support in the uh, code base. So we only support that one so far. And this is with uh, TPM 1.2 for 
for the uh, KVM work that'll be TPM 2.0 that we're working on. Essentially, just to run down on how this works, it's a little bit more complicated, as you might imagine, because now we have multiple layers. So essentially, we have the Zen hypervisor, which is rooted in trust in that hardware TPM still. And each virtual machine that is running in the Zen hypervisor is going to be given its own software-based virtual TPM. And I, I believe this is just the IBM software emulator that's running in here. So as you might imagine, this itself isn't necessarily trustworthy because you could tamper with the software image. So we need a way to be able to verify the integrity of that software TPM. And that's what we'll go into in the next steps here. And essentially, we're going to introduce something called a deep quote to allow us to do this. And the deep quote is going to be from the virtual TPM down to the hardware TPM. So both are going to sign that quote. And then we have a full quote of the entire stack from the firmware up through the hypervisor up into the software TPM. So we have a full view of the entire system that's still rooted in trust in the hardware layer. Let's go into a little bit of detail on how this works. So everything is pretty much the same. You'll notice there's some slight changes. Of course, we have that hypervisor running now, and we have a virtual TPM and an actual hardware TPM. And there's one more component we need to add in order to be able to get this working, and that is a provider registrar. So this is a registrar that's going to be run by the provider, and it's going to essentially be a store of the hypervisor level, the hardware TPM keys. Uh, so essentially, we have two different uh, verifications during the registration process now instead of just one. So essentially, instead of just tying the uh, attestation identity key with the endorsement key burned into the chip, we need to do it both for the virtual TPM and for the hardware TPM to make sure they're both tied together with those attestation identity keys. So now during the registration process, the big change here is we're going to use a deep quote because again, we can't necessarily trust that software virtual TPM that's running. Somebody could have just like tampered with it. They could have changed the way it works. They could have put their own keys in there that we can't necessarily trust. So the first thing that the tenant registrar is going to do is it's going to request a deep quote from the cloud node. A deep quote is going to go down through all the way down to the hardware TPM layer to get a full quote. And because of that, the registrar is going to be able to check in the hardware TPM to make sure that not only the firmware and the hypervisor are trustworthy, but that the virtual TPM is also trustworthy and it's what we expect it to be in the state it's in. So now we can trust that virtual TPM software image that's running, and we know that the communications we have with it are trustworthy as well. So the keys that it's giving us are also trustworthy. And then the next component that's a little bit different is that now the registrar actually needs to reach down to the provider registrar to make sure that the attestation identity key that the hardware TPM is using is also trustworthy. The tenant registrar is going to be checking to make sure the endorsement key in the virtual TPM matches the attestation identity key that's generated by the software TPM. But we still need to make sure that the attestation identity key in the hardware TPM level ties back to that hardware endorsement key that's in there. So that's where it needs to reach back to that provider uh, registry to make sure that that is also in place. Then the other change that's a little bit different is that now instead of doing normal quotes, we need to do deep quotes while we're verifying the system. And this doesn't necessarily need to be done every time, because as you might imagine, it's a bit more expensive since we need to do a full quote all the way down to the hardware level. So you definitely want to do it the first time you verify to make sure that the software TPM is in a trustworthy state from the verifier's perspective. After that, you can do like a lighter quote that's just a normal quote at the software level. Maybe occasionally you want to do that deep quote also to make sure it's still in a good state, like the hypervisor and everything. Uh, so that's right down to the virtual TPM. Um, so that's everything that's going on right now. Uh, and so what, what are we looking to do in the future? Uh, so we're looking to port. So one of the things that we, we have done is to port the agent from the original Python code base into the Rust language for security and performance um, benefits. Uh, so we, we're investigating if we need to port other components into Rust or some other higher level language um, to, you know, it, to make sure that things run, run um, as we want them. Um, so the other major thing and what's, you know, good for this community is, is we're looking at the um, compatibility for, you know, Realm, for CentOS, for uh, Ubuntu for you know whatever you're, whatever you want to run it on. We're we're looking for help 
you know, in, in validating that stuff. Um, we're doing we're doing that work internally right now, but uh, we're a group of a half dozen uh, working on all these pieces. So um, you know, feel free to, to jump in and, and join us. Um, but we're also looking at different architectures like ARM um, for IoT type uh, um, uh, applications um, and system diversity testing. You know, it, just because it works on my laptop. Running, you know, CentOS doesn't mean it works on, you know, Charlie's laptop, you know, running on CentOS. We want to make sure that, you know, it can run across, you know, all major form factors um, consistently. Uh, so that's things to, to, that are we're looking at. Um, and the other major thing is we're looking into the containerization space. How do we containerize the keyline itself, and then also how do we attest containers uh, with keyline? So that's that's the next future step that we're we're currently. So that's how you protect yourself, and come join us. You know we're an open community, uh, looking for contributions. Um, so feel free to jump on to keyline.dev and find us out. We've got a community meeting every Wednesday, um, and we're happy to invite new people along. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Of course, Neil does. Of course, he does. Yeah, we have some time for Neil. I know Neil. It's okay. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, moving from Python to Rust as your uh, as a target for non-agent components. Um, what what are the factors in you considering moving to Rust versus some of the other um, I think you meant lower level languages right. rather than higher level ones. Right, yeah. um, so, could you speak a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, you can jump in on that one. This is actually off a couple times. Uh, Thanks, Good. In your favor. Hi right. there. Uh, so, essentially, one of the big issues with using Python, at least, uh, is that we want to integrate this into the early boot process so it can actually be there. The very first thing that comes up in pulling like the entire Python stack and everything in there is nothing nightmare. So we're trying to shy away from that so we don't have to have like a giant image. But um, for Rust, the big thing is like the memory safety options and everything, making sure that we can have a trustworthy system, especially for the agent itself. Uh, so we're currently working on uh, moving over to Rust for the agent, just so we can have those protections in place and it's a lot faster than having to run it in Python. And Eventually, as Andrew said, we're trying to move the entire system over eventually to be running in, pot, in Rust just to have the whole system that's trustworthy. Um, why do you think Rust makes it more trustworthy as opposed to other uh, system languages that may offer uh, memory safety semantics as an option to use? Uh, it's just one that uh, we kind of limit. We had some like, training where we had been introduced into Rust and it seems like a good option, but we didn't really like Weigh the options for that. <laughs> but feel free to join the community and write it in something else, too. It's, it's yeah, the open community. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, I have a few options. I might be the dumbest guy in the room, so uh, forgive me if these are a bit naive or high level. Um, first off, on the OS list, Fedora was not there. Was that just uh, an oversight, oversight, or is it assumed? Yeah, oversight. Yeah, we're doing the Fedora packaging right now, so it's 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 targeted as current. Um, so the other ones were kind of that future. Once we get Fedora packaged and and it into the stream, you know, we're going to be working on making sure that the other um, other OSs, you know, follow suit. So okay, and. Um, do tools such as uh, identity management pre-IPA fit into this as part of like a complete infrastructure story for a large-scale keyline environment, or do all those pieces need to be separated? Does that make sense? Uh, response to that. 
Well, in general, we're trying to integrate it more into kind of the provisioning that's built into at least like Fedora and Red Hat and everything. So uh, like when Andrew mentioned, like the whitelist and having to generate that, instead of you needing to generate that yourself for the system, uh, tying that into like the package management system as an example, so you can just get all those hashes from there so you already know it's trustworthy. And just like type more tightly integrating it in general into the ecosystem just to make it more user friendly and less work to have to do all that. So it's definitely something we're trying to move to. Okay. <laughs> And uh, last question, um, you mentioned the, the VTPMs as being independent VMs. Do you mean like the full OS virtual machine that needs to be paired up with each node? Yeah, the way the Zen Hypervisor does it is it just stands up VTPMs next to each VM that it will run, and that's isolated from the VM itself. So the VM can't directly use the VTPM. It needs to actually communicate through like some extra uh, hypervisor to get to that. It needs to go through the hypervisor to get to it. So I guess I'm, I'm just thinking about like load. So that means for every virtual machine I might have running on on Zen, it would need a paired VM. So that, that, that would kind of double the virtual machine load. Is that correct? But the, at least the VTPM one can be very lightweight. It just needs to have that software TPM running in it. It's very small, the software TPM. Okay. Thanks. I may be the other dumb person in the room. Um, in terms of virtualization, um, how are you going to handle failover? I mean, you, you've got a TPM, which you've, uh, you've got a piece of hardware that's tied to, to something, and then uh, you, know, up, you go up the stack, and you have all these virtual TPMs. How, how are you going to handle failover if that first node fails and you need to move over to that second, second node or third node and, and so on? I mean, how is this going to scale out? So at least, uh, so one option you could do is you would have uh, like multiple nodes that they are running that you've already tested and are up and running. So you just have multiple copies of your service or whatever you have running. And so each one would be in a trustworthy state. So if one of them fails, you can just fall over to the next one that's already trustworthy and you know it's in a good state. So you wouldn't necessarily need to keep like bringing up new ones. But then your virtual systems would have to get the new key from the from their new V their new piece of hardware, right? And well you could you could provision all of the VMs with the same keys so they're all running in the same state. And then you can easily roll them over the it depends on how you want to set that up. All right. Any more questions, comments? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.